So if you have a Bible, please grab it and turn to James chapter 2. We are in the book of James. We're walking through uh, this very practical book. It's very practical. It's very, um, it's got a lot of uh, almost uh, simple, almost elementary teaching sometimes. Things that we would think are super, super stuff that we should have learned almost in junior high. But what we also forget about sometimes is even as adults, we need to be reminded of the things that we were taught as kids. You know, as kids, you're taught things like um, <clears throat> pick up your clothes, right? Out of your room. Pick your clothes up. Don't, don't leave your shoes in the floor. Were y'all taught this? I was taught this, right? Okay. So if I'm saying something you don't know, let me know. Um, here you go. Um, but how many of you still leave your shoes on the floor? Raise your hand. Okay, so hang on. What's wrong with you? You were taught this as a child. See my point? There's still these things, and that's what I love about this book. You, if you ever think to yourself, well, I've already read that book of the Bible. I don't need to study that one again. Or, Man, just remember, there's so much in here that we haven't picked up yet. Um, this week we're actually going to be talking about something kind of very interesting, which I think uh, we probably, as a church, need more than we think we need. James starts out the book talking about trials, that God is going to allow things to come our way so that we can grow and, and persevere into maturity. And then from that same conversation he says, but also you need to remember as Christians, things are going to happen. Uh, you're going to be tested and tempted in certain ways that are going to cause your resolve to sin, to fail, and you're gonna, ha and your lust of your heart is gonna be, um, is gonna be tempered, and you're gonna have to learn to resist temptation while you, while you submit under trial. And he tells us this right off the bat because as Christians, we all know this is the first things that happen to us when we come to know Christ. The first things we experience is our, uh, our faith being tested, the things of life pressing down on us. The next thing he walks into is our mission. He finishes chapter 1 with this verse. Look up at the screen, or if you have your Bible, look at the end of verse 1, chapter 1, verse 27. He says this, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. In other words, to, to be of service to them. Not just to show up and go, Oh, hey, widow, how you doing? You doing okay? Good. And it's to serve them in their distress, right? He says this. He says, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. This is what we're to be about. He's giving us our mission. And that's really what the whole book of James is about. It's about how do we live out our faith in this world? A faith that serves, a faith that acts, a faith that moves and lives. <clears throat> Not just a faith that says things but doesn't do anything. And so the next, very next statement as we walk into chapter 2 is he's going to deal with this concept of favoritism. And now here's what I mean by that. Um, and ladies, I apologize ahead of time. I'm a sports guy, uh, and so I think sometimes in sports analogies, so forgive me. But yesterday, I was watching uh, North Carolina beat the pants off of Miami. Did anybody else watch that game? I mean, it was awesome. Uh, basketball, by the way. Um, and North Carolina, at like six minutes left to go, North Carolina was up by 40 points. I'm not kidding. It was awesome. And, um, and Miami's ranked number 11. And North Carolina's number 5 in the country. And so you, you expected it to be a tough game, but man, it was a beating. I mean, North Carolina just was whooping them. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this game, and it seemed like every uh, North Carolina uh, took advantage of every perfect opportunity. They never made a flaw. Miami made a bunch of mistakes. They were throwing the ball away. They just couldn't keep it together. And, uh, I mean, and it was just a shellacking. And as I was thinking about this, earlier that day, I had just got through coaching Quinn's upward basketball team. And, and I was thinking to myself, what would have happened if the North Carolina team the two guards, the two guys uh, dribbling the ball, bring the ball down, what would have happened if they only passed to one another? I want you to think about that. Five guys on a team. 
if two of those guys, let's say they were best friends. Let's say they grew up together. Let's say they played ball since they were little kids. And they have just, they, they know each other's moves. They know how each other thinks. And now they're on this college team. They're going to go from college. They're going to be playing the pros someday. And they're going to play together. And so they only pass to one another. Now, let me ask you. Do you think the outcome of the Miami-North Carolina game would have been the same? if they would have ignored the other three players on the team. Ignore the posts, ignore the forwards, let's let the guards play. How do you think the outcome of that game would have been? It would have been radically different, right? More than likely, Miami would have easily picked up on this and shut the guards down, knowing, well, there are only, there are only two guys. Well, gosh, let's put five on two. They're never going to pass to these other guys. And they would have just dominated. They would have pressed from the start, and they would have shut them down. I mean, it wouldn't even have been a close game, right? Now I want you to think about something. As we get into this idea of favoritism, that is exactly what happens to the church when we fall victim to this idea. Look at your text with me. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. What we're going to do is look at how favoritism is so destructive to the mission of the church. Don't forget... Paul is talking about now our mission. We're to live by faith in this world. Our goal is that we are on a mission for the sake of the gospel. We are on a mission with the purpose of the gospel. And don't forget, in this whole thing, our goal is to live out the gospel. And now he's going to tell us of something that handicaps us in our pursuit of being gospel-centered people. Okay? So look at your text. Look at verse 1. First of all, he's going to show us that favoritism, it doesn't work. It's improper. It's ungodly. Look at the text. He says, My brothers, do not hold your faith in the glory, glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Now what he's going to do here is he's basically rebuking the church, rebuking the Jewish Christians that are spread abroad, for choosing to like certain people, to, to honor certain people, and to not honor or to put down other people. Now, I would venture to say that if we really, really get personal, and I were to ask this of you, is this something that you practice in your own life? To be honest, most of us are going to say, well, no. Right? Most of us are going to say, we don't do that. I treat everybody the same. That's because we are, to be honest, we have this inflated idea of who we are. Uh, it's called the uh, Lake Wobegon effect. I've talked about this before. Remember uh, Lake Wobegon from the uh, Prairie Home Companion? Is that what it is? Uh, the talk show series where all the, the kids are, all the women are strong and all the men are beautiful or something. I can't remember how it goes. Something like that. Good looking. Thank you. Yes. And the idea is that we all think we're better than we are. So when it comes to this, I, to believe it or not, all week long, I kept going, okay, now Jolene, how do we do this? Do we do this? What are some aspects of our life that we do this? And to be honest, I really had to shake myself because I was like, I don't do this. And in my mind, so I'm thinking, I don't do this. I don't treat some people better than I treat others. The more, I, from, <laughs> from Monday to Saturday... It began to become more apparent of just how, to be honest, how this really has infiltrated me as well. The Bible says in Romans 2.11, in Ephesians 6.8, in Colossians 3.25, and over 25 different places from the Old Testament to the New Testament says that God, in God there is no partiality. That God doesn't play favorites, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, it doesn't matter. God does not play favorites. He is no, what the Bible uses in another term, is respecter of person. And so this idea of being, uh, of us putting one group of people above another is what I would say is ungodly, or it is improper for us to do that as the church. When we do that, we become like this basketball team that only passes to one another. That's really what we become. Uh, have you ever seen a church, uh, I call it the inbred church, you ever seen a church that becomes this beautiful little holy huddle of Christians? And, and man, we, in, we become just this very uh, church-centered, it's all about our stuff, it's all about our comfort, it's all about what we get from just being around each other. Um, have you ever been to a church, uh, man, this is going to sound like I'm throwing stones at, at glass houses, but is that the phrase? Um, you ever been to a church that has a restaurant in it? 
or Starbucks or a coffee shop or a, I have. Heck, I, I used to be a youth pastor at one in Little Rock. Have bookstores in the churches and they have all their stuff here to where the Christians don't ever have to leave the church. You get everything. You're, we're a one-stop shop. You want breakfast? Come to church early. You want to hang out late? We got lunch afterwards. And I get it. They're trying to develop community. There's, they're trying to develop a closeness so that we can stand against the tide of the world. I understand the purposes behind it. But what it's done is it's perverted the, the actual direction of the Christians. And so the Christians now, because it's like going to the mall. It's got a food court. It's got, uh, I can get some uh, Christian t-shirts there and I can get the books I want to read and they've got the sermon tapes on series and everything and all of, our, all of our friends are here. And so why would I even need to leave the doors of this place? And that's really what we're talking about. We become what we know, are known as inbred Christians. We're never reproducing. We're never growing. We're ne the gospel isn't leaving us. We're just passing the ball back and forth, having this great game. Man, and it's fun. But we forget the defense has pretty much just shut us down to where this is the game we're playing. Just pass it back and forth. <laughs> we haven't scored a point in years. But man, we're having a I mean, I could pass the ball. Woo! Oh, I was behind my back. Woo! You know, I look like Jason Williams. I mean, it, you see my point? This is what we are about, and we forget that there's a much bigger game, and Satan's got us easily made. Watch, look at this analogy he gives, and this is why I love James. He does such a great job of illustration. Look at this, look at this analogy in verse 2. It says, For if a man comes into your assembly with gold rings dressed in fine clothes, and there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes, and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing fine clothes, and you say, You sit in a good place. I brought the chair up here. Thank you, uh, Tom. I brought this chair from home. What if this was us? What if we really said, I'll get to the, the people on the camera can see. What if this was us? What if, what if we did this? What if I said, I have all of your giving statements and I'm going to bring them out and I'm going to read them to you and the one who has given the most the greatest giver gets a place of honor. What would you do? You'd all be embarrassed, right? One, because you've given so little. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that was a joke. It's a joke. No, it would be uncomfortable. Even if you've given a lot, you'd be like, ah, uh, I don't want to do that. Don't do that. And what about if I said, you who have given the least... Well, we have a chair back there. Dave, hold up that chair. There's your chair. You get to sit back there by the sound booth. No offense to all you people actually sitting by the sound booth. Sorry. Now, what if, that was our, what if that was our church? What if that was how the Christians acted? Now, here's the thing. James is making a really uh, ostentatious analogy of what actually happens in little minute crystallized forms of the church all the time and we sometimes don't see this that we play favorites that we will treat these people good because of what they have and really here's the sin we, we treat them different because of the way they look or appearance that's the first thing in other words how they look how they dress do they wear the clothes we like to wear do they look different than us the color of their skin the church, is, I mean, I don't know if you look around, we're a very, for the most case, a very white American world. Denton is a very white city. Is, let me ask you that. Is that the demographic of the church of God? No, it's not. The church is diverse. It's full of all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds. Rich, poor, uh, dark skin, light skin. It doesn't matter. God says uh, women, men, children. There's no partiality with God. Um, here's the other one. Not only do we do it based on uh, appearance, but we also judge a lot of times based on our income level. Do you know that? That we will look at someone based on what they make. If you have a nice business, a big business, well, I want to go be your friend. And maybe somebody who we know can't hang out with us, do what we do, well, we don't, we don't want to go necessarily be friends with them sometimes. It's in these little minute ways. Here's another one. 
influence. Influence. We love to be friends with people who have power, right? Somebody who can, who knows somebody. Have you ever used this phrase, man, that guy, he knows a lot of rich people. I've actually said those words. I have. Man, I know this guy, and man, he just knows, he just knows tons of millionaires in the city. Like, what does that even matter? Who cares, right? But that, and I'm saying these things because we forget about this stuff. We look at a person's appearance, their income, their influence, and we make judgment calls whether or not we want to approach them, be close to them. That's what he's talking about here. Do they get a seat of prominence in our church? Do they have to sit in the back because, well, they really don't have any influence, so why do I want to invite, why do I really want them in this congregation with us? We want to be people who have influence, right? So we can mobilize and go out and, and, and be the gospel for this world. Not knowing that, well, maybe God has, has a whole diverse population of people to minister to a diverse population of people, right? Keep looking at your text. Now he's going to show us not only is favoritism improper, he's also going to show us it's irrational. It doesn't make any sense. Look in verse, uh, verse 5 there. You're going to see it's out of sync. This doesn't mix with the will of God. It doesn't, doesn't fit with God's will. He says, he says, listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? Now what He's doing is He's showing you this diversity that He's... It, it doesn't matter if you're poor or rich. He's not necessarily the, saying that those who are wealthy and have lots of money and look a certain way, they aren't rich in faith at all. But what he's showing you is that if you make this distinction and you only focus here, that you ignore the fact that God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith too. That it doesn't matter about your material uh, possessions as much as it matters about your spiritual uh, growth, your spiritual maturity. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what all of the first part of James was about in chapter 1. It looks like this. A lot of us uh, have driven around, especially in the, the, the late, in the, uh, here recently, and you, you start to see a lot of new buildings going up, right? A lot of new houses. Can you imagine, can you imagine if a builder, he's got his foundation laid, concrete is laid, plumbing is, is in, and he's now about to frame. The truck brings all this big pile of wood and it stacks it up and there and then the guys are just about to get ready to go to work. They've got the blueprints out and everything. And all of a sudden the builder says, you know what? This isn't going to work. And he takes a big old can of gas and he pours it on the wood and he lights a match and he lights that wood on fire. Seems pretty irrational, right? You and I would probably say, dude, just sell the wood. If you, just, if you changed your mind, like, return it. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. That's what he's saying here. Here we are. We're on mission. The church is to be about the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to love our neighbors ourselves. He says, love one another. Love as I have loved you. And yet, as the church, when we separate and segregate, what we're doing really is the idea, believe it or not, it's called discrimination. All of us twinge at the thought, do you discriminate? Are you discriminatory? We would all go, no. Well, no, no, because we instantly think race, right? We think race when we do that. That's the buzzword now in our world for race. So we all are quick, especially if you're white Americans, we're quick to go, well, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not racist. I'm not a, I don't discriminate. I love everybody. I grew up in a world where, man, I, I, man, I, I know. I know better than that. That's what our, my, I know that's my first gut feeling. But it's not just necessarily about race when it comes to the church. The point is, is that we're on a much bigger mission than that. And God's trying to show us and expand our vision of what He has for us. So not only is it out of sync, keep looking. Look at verse 6. It also... Here's another reason why it's irrational. It favors those who bring about oppression. It favors the oppressor. Look at, his, look at what he says in verse 6. But if you dishonor the poor man, in other words, if you make him sit in the back because of the way he looks, his income, the way he appears, or his influence, he says, is it not the rich who op oppresses you and personally drags you into court? 
During this time, you need to understand that during the first century Mediterranean uh, Jewish world, it wasn't like it is today. There wasn't a middle class like there is today. As a matter of fact, it was very much a caste system. Not so much as you see in India, but very, very similar. There was no progression of movement within the caste, which is similar like we see in India. There was a, uh, an elite, high-income uh, group that was, that was uh, the Sanhedrin, uh, the Fer made up of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the... Uh, um, the Essenes, these guys made up a, a, a class of wealthy people who were in charge. And then you had a very large lower class. And there wasn't much, if, if any, in the middle. As a matter of fact, if you ever see uh, um, the way the, the Jewish leaders really attacked Jesus, as you read the, uh, the Gospels, what you see is what they call honor challenges. Because Jesus was constantly challenging the status quo of the caste. He was constantly going and, and, and questioning what these guys were doing in such a way that the lower class was not to do. And so these guys would come at him with questions and there would be this honor challenge back and forth. And what did Jesus always do? He always shut them down, which made them mad. And he was challenging not only their religious authority, he was challenging the social structure in a lot of ways. And you see this constantly in the New Testament. Them coming to him with a question, him totally destroying their argument, them leaving wanting to murder him. Right? That's, what, that's the whole setup of this idea. And so the rich were the ones who kept the lower class at bay. If you had an argument, well, they would drag you to court because you couldn't afford the lawyers they could afford. You couldn't afford the defense they could afford. And they had the defense, they had the, the, the court system wrapped up. They were all cronies. They were buddies. And so there wasn't this real fairness. So he says, aren't these the guys that you're favoring? You want them, you, the, the rich that have come to know Christ, you're, you're lifting them up on a pedestal and you forget these are the guys who oppress. And look at what else he says. He says, do they not also blaspheme the fair name with which you have been called? These guys, by doing so, they become blasphemers. When uh, um, I don't know about you, but when somebody says something bad about one of my friends, you know what it does to me? It makes me angry. I don't know about you. Have you ever had a friend where somebody, you, maybe you were out and somebody said something bad? about somebody that you loved. Probably can't remember a time. Um, I, got a, 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 I saw a letter that came in the mail. It was, I'm, I'm, not gonna, try not gonna, I'm trying not to be political right now. Uh, I have a good friend who's running for a position in the state government. And uh, I saw this thing in the mail that came from an, his opponent. And it was just ripping. And I know this guy. I know this. He's a friend of mine. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And as I read through this, I got angry. Because this guy was blaspheming my buddy. He was blaspheming him. And then I saw another one. It's like, no! And I was like, I'm like, all right, I got I to call him. I got to call this guy. I got I to gotta tell some people. I got to get on Facebook. I got to put a video. I'm like, I was ready to just rip and destroy with my great influence, this state representative <laughs> for what he was saying to my, about my friend. You see the point here? He's saying it's irrational. You've been called, you've been given a new name. You're called Christians because Christ died for your sin. You call yourself a Christian and yet you give favoritism to the very ones who blaspheme the name of the guy who died for you. How do you... How can you do that? He's saying this doesn't make sense. The, we're called on a mission and yet here is what the church does. Look back at your text. Keep reading. Look in verse 8. Now he's going to look at something. Now he's going to take it even more personal. This idea of favoritism is not only improper, not only is it uh, uh, irrational, but it's also illegal. It's illegal for the church to do this. Look at the text. Verse 8. Gives a good if, if clause, all right? If, now he's going to give you an illustration. If, however, you fulfill the royal law, 
according to the scripture. Now he gives us the law. He says, you shall love your neighbors yourself. He says, you are doing well. Very simple. You obey the law, you're doing good. Let me ask you a question. What do you think about these things? I'm going to give you some things. I want you to tell me how you feel about them. Is it okay to tell a lie sometimes in there? I mean, let me say it this way. Is it okay to bear false witness at some moments? That's a better one. Because we, we, lying is like, well, that's a very broad topic, Chris. <laughs> If my wife comes in and she's wearing a dress that is nasty, I'm not going to say that dress is nasty. All right? We're all smarter than that. So let's say bear false witness, okay? Is it okay to say bear false witness a little bit? Well, we would all probably go, well, yeah, there's probably a time. How about this? I'll go to a much easier one. Um, what if you're given too much change at a store? You're given too much change and you realize it pretty quick, right? I mean, your wallet's heavier. <laughs> and we all know how heavy our wallets can be. And you can tell. Or you, you count it out. What do you do? Well, I'm already in the car and we're already in... Now I'd have to drive back. You know what, kids? I'll, turn, I'll return it later, kids. You see, now we have a conflict. Of, of, of the law, right? Um, here's another one. Um, how about just a little bit of gossip? Just a smidgen of gossip. How do we feel about those, that sin? Is it okay at certain points to, to, to do that? How about this one? Let me, let me keep going. What about throwing, when you're out cleaning up after your dog in the backyard, and there's only one little pile, and you throw it over your fence into your neighbor's yard? <laughs> Y'all don't do that? No. I don't either. I don't either. I don't, I don't know why. I'm just bringing it up. I thought it was a good one. Forget I said that one. You see? You see? The, the, believe it or not, we all have within us this little mechanism that says, that's not that bad. Do you know that? We all do stuff all the time that we justify and we say, that's really, that's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal that I treated that person that way. I mean, nobody's hurt. Nobody's, nobody, nobody said anything. But keep looking at your text. Look at verse 9. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin. And are yourself, excuse me, and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. So now he's saying this. He's saying, wait, 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 wait. If you... If you do this, you're breaking the law. This, for Christians, is illegal. This is something that we don't do as Christians. We don't show favoritism. We don't show partiality. We don't play favorites and put you over here and put you guys that we don't like over there. We don't do that. Here's what, he's, here's what we mean by that. Verse 10, he says, For whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in only one point of it, he himself has become guilty of all. Man! That's really bad. You mean to tell me that if I take this jug of water and I pour Kool-Aid in it, the whole thing is now Kool-Aid? Yeah. Again, this is stuff we learned as children. You can't take the Kool-Aid out of the water. So if you and I at some point have broken the law, we are law breakers. And therefore, we've done something illegal as the church. Keep going. He says, for he... Who said, do not commit adultery, has also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you commit adultery, but do, excuse me, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. You, we can't pick and choose, right? The beautiful thing here is that he said that, that there's this law of liberty, this royal law, this law that Christ himself has brought to us through grace. And that's what we're going to get to now. I don't want to spend too heavy of time on this because now we're all squirming, right? We're all incredibly uncomfortable. Because wait a second, I probably do this more than I think I do. I probably have lived in a world that is out of sync with the will of God just by very nature of being who I am. Watch this. Look at verse 12. Now he's going to show us how we combat this. How do we fight this? That's what we're all waiting for, right? How do we break this chain that possibly has infiltrated our, even our church? 
Verse 12, he says, So speak and so act as though you are to be judged by the law of liberty. Ah, oh, thank God for grace, right? The law of liberty. Remember, he's, in other words, he's telling you, he said, remember who you are and all that God has done to make you who you are. Don't forget these things, that you're being judged by this law that Christ has brought through the cross. Does the law matter? Absolutely. It has shown me that I am a transgressor. But praise God for mercy. I almost I was going to bring my whiteboard up, but I thought I had too many illustrations this morning. But if I had a whiteboard up here right now, here's what I would do. I would draw on it the word you on one side. And I'd draw the word law on the other side. And I would connect those two with a balance. With a, uh, a weight system. And I would show you that if you put the law on one side, you have broken the law and you are out of balance. You have been found wanting when it comes to the law. And you would be lifted up here because you can't measure up to the law. You can't bring the law into balance. The weight of the law will always destroy you. But in this verse, what brings this into balance, the law of liberty, is the cross. The cross gets set on your side in such a way that now you are in balance with the law. He has taken your unrighteous acts and placed them on Christ. And Christ, being righteous, has balanced out the weights. Make sense? This is grace. Look what he says. Look in verse 11. For judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the call of the church. Just as Christ's mercy has triumphed over the judgment that is to befall all of us, this is the call of the church. We are to be the merciful. We are to be the ones who walk out into the world and we don't go, I want to go here because I like these people. I'm not going to go here because I don't like these people. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say this. I, I come up with things during the week and I always ask my wife and she, a lot of times she's like, don't say that. But I'm going to say it anyway. Because I'm done. Uh, I have this thing. I like Target. I don't like Walmart. I typically don't like Walmart because it's dirty, usually. I like clean. I don't like dirty. So if your kids are dirty, tell them to stay away from me. <laughs> I, I like clean. Um... But I started to realize that my prejudice between Walmart and, and Target was actually deeper than clean and dirty. I didn't like the way the people looked in a Walmart. I didn't. Isn't that sad? Do you do that? Do you walk out and walk into a Target and go, hmm, these are my people. <laughs> Is that what you do? That's what I did. I did. I'm not kidding. I'd go to Macy's. Macy's is cool, isn't it? I'd say, these are my people. I would. Um, you know what I do when I go into Walmart now? The first thing out of my mouth? I t and my wife, she, she'll, she, she'll tell you this. You know the first thing out of my mouth? These are my people. <laughs> I do. I say it. I walk right in and I greet the greeter. You are my people. <laughs> My people, I, I run down the aisle. My people, my people, I'm here with you. We are together. <laughs> because there's something greater going on. The church is to be about mercy, not judgment. Something I didn't say is he says we become judged with evil motives. You know what that means? That means that we have become discriminatory and prejudice. Now here's how we combat this. Okay? I'm going to give you three things and they'll be on your... That, that if you focus, I believe, on these three things in your life, you will see this... We will begin... Let me say it this way. If you focus on these three things in your life, you will begin to pass the ball to the rest of the team. And you will begin to actually play the game and be on mission the way God has meant for us to be on mission. The first thing is that we have got to become courteous. 
courteous is such an unused word sometimes, right? Because we all think, well, of course I'm going to be courteous. No, 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 no. Courteous is the idea that no matter where I go, I'm going to treat people the same. When I say the word courteous, probably a few words, that, phrases that come into your mind. You probably think about someone holding the door open for someone else, right? Chivalry. Um, you might think of someone helping when their arms, you know, somebody's leaving in the house and their arms are full and you run out to help them carry their stuff. The old days, it might have been, you know, helping a, a, an older woman across the street. That's being courteous. And I challenge us to think of new ways. What are some new ways that we can live courteous lives? That when we leave this place, from the moment we walk into the office, from the moment we walk into the school, from the moment we go home with our neighbors, that we can act not in a way that serves me, but in a way that is courteous to others. I thought of one the other day as I was coming home. I was thinking through this text. My, my next door neighbor, he, he uh, b uh, takes old furniture and he redoes it. And his whole uh, garage is full of all this old great stuff that he's been working on. He does all this great woodwork. And he was in the back of his truck. And I could tell he's uh, probably early 60s. And he's got this dresser. And I mean, and he's bit backwards. He's manhandling this thing, trying to get it out. I was like, hey, Greg. And I totally went inside. Not lying. I did it. But as I got in the door, I was like, ah! Oh. It's like an electric shock. The Holy Spirit. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. And I went out. I'm like, Greg. And I ran over to the back of his truck. Hey, I got you, man. And I helped him. We got that dude in the car. And in the, in the, it's got that dude in his garage. It's, that's the way it should be. I wish. I wish God did that. For real. You know? I walk back out. My hair's straight up. I'm at, I'll help you. What do you mean? But we don't. He's not going to do that. We need to be courteous. Here's, the other, here's a verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.15 says this, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another. And for all people, for all people. The next one is this, that we are to be compassionate. Compassionate. I would say that compassion is courtesy on steroids. Compassion is courtesy on steroids. Courtesy is, hey, let me help you with that. Um, compassion is feeling the emotions that another person is feeling. To be honest, that's compassion. When somebody hurts, you don't just go, oh, man, that stinks. Flip the channel, right? No, it's to get down where that person is and to feel what they feel. That is true compassion. Not just to go that, yeah, there's a homeless problem in this city, and you know what? We got some great people out there doing something about it. You know, yeah, there's a lot of nursing homes in this city and full of lonely people. And I'm sure there's some great ministries out there doing something about it. Man, maybe I could give some money to them. You know what? That jail is full of incarcerated men who need Christ. And I'm so glad that Denton has great ministries to the jail, to the prisoners in this city. I might, I need to shake one of those guys' hands for doing that ministry. Is it, See, this is courtesy on steroids. This is us actually feeling what is happening to others. Believe it or not, we're real quick to do it to each other. I'm real quick to grab you and go, man, I can tell something's wrong. Come sit with me. What can I do for you? But man, when we step outside of our comfort zone, it just becomes almost impossible for the church to, to actually engage the mission of God for some weird reason. I, I... Here's the next one. We've got to be courteous. We've got to be compassionate. And I believe that the key to this is consistency. We have to become consistent. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.14, it says, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. It's talking about us growing up, right? It's talking about us living more consistent lives, he says, by the trickery of men and by the crafty and deceitful scheming. 
It's easy for us to do these things once. It's easy for us to do them twice. But for us to, be, to truly be the church, working the ball down the court, breaking Satan's press, working the defense and, and actually putting the ball in a hole. Again, ladies, I'm sorry for the basketball analogy. Just It's where my world is. We've got to be firing on all of these cylinders. We've got to be courteous, compassionate, consistent Christians living out the gospel on mission. And I think what gets us, what gets us off mission is that we forget that we're on mission. My daughter, you know what she gets in trouble for most? Forgetting what I told her. That's really what she gets in trouble for. Quinn has, he's older, he remembers better, but Jovi, when she gets in trouble, it's like, Jovi, I told you not to do that. I forgot. It's because you're four. <laughs> we don't need to be a bunch of four-year-old Christians in the church, right? Let's grow up. If you still think that favoritism is no big deal, let me give you some things here. Favoritism is inconsistent with the character of God. It is inconsistent with the teaching of the Bible. It is inconsistent with the mission of the church. And here's a few things that it does. It devalues humanity. It says that these people have no value. Can you ever, ever, ever imagine Jesus saying those words? That you have no value in this world. Not only does it devalue people, it destroys the outreach of the church. It destroys it. And here's what it does even more. It disengages the church from the world. There's a great book that you all should get. It's called The Church of Irresistible Influence. It was written by an old pastor of mine. who It's, uh, it's probably been around for 15 years now, this book. And the whole point of the book is that he's addressing this fact that the church, in most cases, has become an isolated island. And he's trying to help us understand how do we become a church of irresistible influence? Where it's, it, you just, people want to see what's going on inside these walls. That they can't wait to meet somebody from this congregation. And it's all about how do we build bridges from, from this community of Christians to, this, to the world. To those who don't know Christ. To those who are hurting. And, and the whole concept is we have got to be a church that engages in the conversations, in the battles. And, not just, and don't be intimidated that you don't know anything. Don't be intimidated that you don't know your Bible like maybe you, quote unquote, should. That's not the point. The greater thing is that you have a Holy Spirit in you who has given you a power and a boldness to do incredible, amazing things wherever you are. And He's given you the grace to cover your sins so you can walk out these doors, not walking a walk of shame, but be alive, forgiven, ah, relatable to a world who's broken, right? There's not a person in here who's not relatable to somebody outside these doors because you are, have experienced the same brokenness that they have. The difference is, is that Christ has interceded on your behalf. Amen?